How we doing? I'm really excited about this. Every now and then they actually let me teach a little bit, which is awesome. Which is awesome. Okay, so last week Christian taught. What did he teach us about? You can cheat. You can look at your notes. Redirect. Redirecting our worship to Christ. Okay, that's the purpose of our ministry. It's what we're all about. It's what we're about at launch. We're here to train you to help redirect other people's worship to Christ. Today, I want to help you redirect your worship to Christ. Because we're in here because we're worshipers of Jesus, but that doesn't mean we don't have idols. Somebody say amen. amen. Yeah, that's not a thing you want to get excited about. Is it? All right, let me pray, and then we're going to get into it. Lord Jesus, um, part of what we want to do, Lord, in this ministry is sanctify ourselves, to set ourselves apart, to consecrate ourselves so that we can be more effective servants and vessels for you to use. And my prayer is that you'll use these few words that we speak together today to help us do some deep heart work. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. All right. Take everything that's in your lap and put it on your seat. And everybody stand up because who is better? Let's play the comparison game. You can only win if you're better than everyone else. So here's how the comparison game is going to work. You will find a partner. And everybody will find a partner. And then we're going to do comparison game round one. One person in the pair will be eliminated and will sit. And then the other person will, be, will remain standing. We'll find another partner and then it will be round two. Clear as mud? All right, everybody find your partner. Five, four, three, two, one. No, I, it has to be two. I have one, I have an unattached person up here. There's one in the back, right, right here. Hey, two blondes, y'all get together. Okay, move out of your row, it's okay. There's gonna be a lot of movement, y'all, so don't, don't think you're gonna stay in your row. That is not gonna happen. It is not going to happen. Okay? Ready? Here's round one of the comparison game. Who is dressed better? The winner stands, the loser sits. Anybody not have a partner? Ready? Round two. I would like you to sing a D. And and uh, and the criteria is who sounds better. Okay, the person who sounds better stays standing. The person who doesn't, have a seat. Can I figure it out? I'm sorry, it's a comparison game. You gotta know how to play. Is that up? Is that up? Help us. Help us, Tech. Help us, Tech. Maybe not. There's a real piano. You know, you know. The secret is, in the comparison game, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. Okay. If you're still standing, you need a new partner. Go find a new partner if you're still standing. It's time for round three. Round three, the comparison game. Oh, we're good. Who needs a partner? There we go. Oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. Everyone? Right, right, right. Okay. You guys ready? Round three. Who's taller? Tall person stay standing. Short person sit down. Short person sit down. You've been making this for four years. <laughs> Who is taller? Okay, who's left? Everybody who's left, come up here. Everybody who's left, come up here. If you're left, come up here. Come up here and find a new partner. Come up here and find a partner. 
You gotta come faster than that. Come on, come on, bro. Come on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, I got four pairs. I got four pairs. Okay, here's round four. Ready? It's the comparison game. First person to solve this problem. 62 times five. <laughs> Okay, if you were the first in your pair to solve it, stay standing. Okay, so who's left? Oh, I've got three. I've got three. Okay, so do I do I pull a wild card? Yeah, I can pull a wild card. Coming up, coming up. Let's go, let's go, let's go. I beat you by height. Okay, round five, you ready? Who has the biggest immediate family? <laughs> Who has the biggest immediate family? Yeah, the, the define immediate family. I'm not, I'm not here to hand out definitions. It's the comparison game. Okay. Okay. Last two. Last two. Final round. Here we go. All right. This is round six. I promise I'm making, not making this up. It's all pre-printed. Round six, who has the darkest complexion? <laughs> Guess who won the command of the game? <laughs> Tell me your name. April. April is better than everyone. <laughs> everyone. <laughs> Thank you for playing. Thank you for playing. All right. Now, let's debrief that experience. I wish you go back to round one, and you're the one who's not dressed better in your life. How'd that make you feel on the inside? Not so good, right? Okay. And how'd you like it when round three came along and it was, who's taller? And you're like, if you're short like me, you're like, dang, that's not fair. That's not fair. Who said? Okay. And the reason we went through that exercise is I want you to feel the futility of making constant comparisons. Okay? Because this game sucks. It's dumb. It's arbitrary. The rules are like not made up. There are no standards. Who decides even based on the criteria? It is a dumb game. So why do we play this game in our heads all the time? We do, don't we? We play the comparison game in our heads all the time. Uh, there's a young woman who, uh, who went out on a date. It was a first date with a young man. So they go out at this restaurant, and in the middle of the day, like they had just met, right, so it was like a first, first time thing. The guy just stands up and says, you know what, I'm good, and walks off and leaves her sitting there. Ouch. So she calls her best friend, and her best friend says, well, what did you expect? You don't dress very well. You're not that interesting. You're not a good conversationalist. You need to lose about 20 pounds and your hair's a disaster, and you're not really taking care of yourself, what did you expect was going to happen to you? You're like, what kind of best friend is that? Okay, All right. Well, the rest of the story is, that's not what her best friend said to her. That's what she said to herself. Right? Why would you say something to yourself? Right? Like, why wouldn't you treat yourself better? Right? But we don't. Most of us naturally are very vicious toward ourselves. We don't like ourselves. We're disagreeable. And Paul Tripp, who's a um, he's sort of a theological slash psychological guru, he's written a bunch of books, big ugly mustache, uh, he's a, but he's an intelligent man. He says, you have got to be careful what you say to yourself because nobody talks to you more than you do. And so your own voice is in your own ear all the time. We have to guard our inner, inner conversation. The comparison game that we play is almost entirely this kind of inner self-talk. Now, 
Some of you may be saying, well, I don't really do that. I don't really play the comparison game. Well, don't, don't be too hasty to do that, to, to say that. Because some of us compare ourselves to others, right? It's sort of a common, common thing. But some of us compare ourselves to perfection, right? Some of us do. Some of us compare ourselves to our own expectations, right? And if your expectations of yourself are really high, you're disappointing yourself all the time which is not a good feel. Some of us compare ourselves to the expectations of others. Here's the thing. When you play the comparison game, the outcome is one of two things. Either you win, which leads to pride. It makes you smug and arrogant. I was like, well, I'm just better than her. I don't know where she got those shoes. Right? You go to smug and arrogant. Or you lose the comparison game. And it leads to despair. You think, I'll never measure up. I just don't have what it takes. I'm just not good enough. All right. So today, I would like to show you how to stop playing the comparison game. Ready? Take your Bible or your digital equivalent and go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. While you're finding it, I'm going to set up the context. This is Jesus having the Last Supper with his disciples right before he's crucified. They get there, they're going to have the Passover meal, and uh, um, and somebody's got to wash the feet, because that's what they do, and nobody wants to do it, and, uh, and so that, that's the setup. Now here's the other thing, before we read the, read the thing, I'll, I'll tell you why I'm teaching you about this comparison game. And why it's so important. Because in launch worship training, what we're going to do is we're going to put you in the same room of people who are doing the same thing as you. Like vocalists together, guitar players together, or whatever. And if you are playing the comparison game, launch worship training can be a very vicious experience for you. Right? Because um, we're going to have you sing or play in front of other people, and we're going to tell you what's bad or good about it. That can be a very traumatic experience. Right? This kind of feedback can really be helpful to you if your head's in a good place. But if your head's not in a good place, it can either wreck you or make you intolerably arrogant. And we don't want either one of those to happen. Okay. All right. Ready? John chapter 13. Jesus, Son of God. Verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Here's the key part. Verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. So, that word's very important. So, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Okay. So, Jesus took the lowliest task. He took the lowliest place. Um, he chose an act of humility. And the reason that he did it, and the, the connection that the scripture makes, is that he knew who he was, he was secure in his position with the Father. He was secure in his knowledge of his standing with God. Okay? Do you see that in verse 3? He knew the Father had put all things under his power. So he said, I am washing no feet. No, that's not what he did. So he said, it's okay. I can wash feet. Everything's under my power. He knew that he was coming to God. He knew that. So here's what I want to say to you. Constant awareness that God's love and favor and acceptance of you is secure. Constant awareness of that will free you from the comparison game. Let me say that again. Constant awareness that God's love and favor and acceptance of you is secure will free you from the comparison game. Okay? Now, Let's remind ourselves who we are. How do we get in this room? If you've placed your faith in Jesus, if you're a worshiper of Jesus, 
you're relying on his death, burial, and resurrection to make you right before God, that means God has forgiven your sin. He's adopted you into his own family. You're a Christian. You're saved. Did you get into the family of God through your perfect moral performance? No. As a matter of fact, you can't even be a Christian unless you first admit that you're a moral failure. Repeat after me. I am, I am a, moral failure. a moral failure. Did God accept you because of your irresistible charm? Yes. Oh no. You're horrible and disagreeable. Did he accept you because of your good looks? We already played the comparison game. There's always somebody who looks better than you. I don't care who you are. There's always somebody who looks better. Does God accept you because of your talent? No. And that needs to be a strong no coming from you. God does not accept you. Why does God accept you? Because of? Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Okay. Now, uh, Ephesians 2 kind of clarifies this for us. Because it wasn't your perfect moral performance. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2 says that you are an enemy of God. As a matter of fact, you ought to be going to hell. You ought to be going to hell. I ought to be going to hell. It would be the right thing. It would be just. When you get to heaven and someone asks you, why are you here? You're not going to say it because I was a fantastic vocalist. You're not going to say that. You're not going to say, I'm a tenor and I can sing a high C. You're not going to say that. You're not going to say, have you heard my guitar tones? No. You will say, I ought to be in hell, but God, who is rich in mercy, made me alive with Christ Jesus, even when I was dead in my trespasses and sins. Okay, friends, this is the gospel. He forgave us our sins. He welcomed us into our family, into his family. And so we've gone from being an enemy to being a friend, from being a stranger to being a member of the family. We've gone from being rebels to being worshipers. We've gone from resistors of God to embracers of God, from haters of God to lovers of God, and it is all by grace. <clears throat> End of Ephesians 2. It says, for it is by, you know this verse? For it is by grace. grace that you have been faith. through faith. and faith, not and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, not a result of talent, not a result of charm, not as a result of dedication, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. God loves you like he loves his son. Romans 8. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. But what if I get in the what if I, I get in my launch breakout and I sing that note and I really crack and it's embarrassing? Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Not even a crack note at launch worship. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. So why add to that? It's done. But we often do. We confuse our status with our service. We confuse our person with our performance. We confuse the gospel with our gifting. Do not add your performance to the gospel because that turns it into a false gospel. God accepts me if I trust Jesus and sing well. God accepts me if I trust Jesus and play well. God accepts me if I trust Jesus. Period. Because of Jesus, his perfection is mine. His performance is mine. So, when I sing and play well, I'm loved and accepted. When I sing and play badly, I'm loved and accepted. When I royally blow it, I'm loved and accepted. When I start to click too soon <laughs> and interrupt the preacher, I'm loved and accepted. Now, should you improve your craft? Yes, that is why we're sitting in this room. Can you serve better with more skill, with a better attitude, with more grace and more education and more intelligence? Yes, absolutely yes, and you should. Launch Worship Leader Training is all about helping that to happen for you. But 
It will not make you better, more accepted, more godly, more valuable. Okay? Artists tend to mix this up all the time, and that's why I'm just hammering it like that. So, when you rest secure in the knowledge of your acceptance with God in the same way that Jesus did, it gives you the freedom to choose humility. Okay? So, choosing a lower place doesn't mean that your identity is at risk, because it's not. It's important that you know that it's not at risk. Okay? So, you can receive instruction. It's okay. You can say, there are things that I do not know. Okay, that's okay. I mean, everybody else knows that already. You can receive criticism. You know, you're really not breathing well with your... Uh, no, that's true. That's good. But it, there's no risk because you're loved and accepted and it's okay. You can receive correction. You can receive correction from people who might be less talented than you. It's possible that you could walk into one of your breakouts and be more talented than your instructor. That's possible. Okay. Can you learn from them? Yes. Think about Tiger Woods' golf coach. Do you think Tiger Woods' golf coach is a better golfer than him? No. He's not. Do you think Tom Brady's uh, throwing trainer, do they even have those? I don't even yes, know. Yes, yes. I hope not. I actually hope that he like really bombs today, but uh, that's another thing. Okay. <laughs> do you think Tom Brady's trainers are better athletes than him? Probably not. Probably not. Why do they have them? Because they know that they don't know everything, and that's okay. okay. You can do these things, and your identity is not on the line. When Jesus knelt to wash his feet, he was not surrendering his place as the glorious Son of God. He was not. And so, when you uh, walk into your breakout, and you sing, and it's not spectacular, that's okay. You're a son or daughter of God. You're not surrendering that. You don't have to. And it's okay. It's okay. All right, here are a few things. You might want to write them down. Uh, maybe, because I numbered them. Maybe. Okay, number one. To avoid playing the comparison game, number one, rest in the gospel. You've been saved by grace. It's not about anything that you've done. It's just been given to you, and it's a gift, and it's a standing, and it's a status that cannot be taken away from you. Rest in the gospel. Number two. Remember that the people you serve with serve alongside, have been rescued just like you. So that means if they sing and play better than you, you can just rejoice that God rescued them to sing His praises. And if they sing or play worse than you, you can rejoice that God rescued them to sing His praises. Right? In either case, it doesn't have anything to do with you. It doesn't have anything to do with you. Number three, be self-aware. Uh, David, in Psalm 42, uh, verse 5, he says this, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Some of you need to have that conversation in yourselves as you're like sitting nervous in your breakout. Or uh, when you didn't sing as well as you thought you would, and then you sit down and you pull out your mental stick and you're beating yourself over the head. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why so disquieted within me? He finishes it. Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my Savior and my God. This is actually very healthy psychology. Because what David is doing is he's not listening to his heart, which is savagely wanting to beat him up. He's leading his heart. He's preaching to himself. See what he's doing? Okay. You have to preach the gospel to yourself. When you take out the mental stick and you're beating yourself because you're not good enough, Preach to yourself. Say, self, put the stick down. Stop beating yourself. Because, okay? it, it, I mean, it's a lie anyway. Okay? Don't follow your heart. Jeremiah says your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Do not follow it. Preach to it. Your heart needs to hear the gospel. All right, number four. Check your heart for boasting. Galatians 6, verse 14. Paul says... May it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what boasting is? Boasting is uh, pride expressed in language or attitude. Uh, this is dumb. 
but I watched this on YouTube uh, last night. I'm so fancy, you already know. Right? That is a boasting song. That is a boasting song. There's a lot of, there's a lot of like modern musicians that have songs that are like all about them and how awesome they are. Okay. Watch for that script in your heart. Okay? It's like, mm, man, I'm good. All right? Don't go there. Check your heart for boasting. Okay? Uh, number five. Criticism is not a threat to your identity. It's a means to sharpen and develop the gift God gave you. Criticism is not a threat to your identity. It's a means to sharpen and develop the gift God gave you. And finally, number six. Praise of your performance, of your good performance, is not a foundation stone for your worth. Praise of your performance is not a foundation stone for your worth. It is an amen to what God is doing in and through you. And so, um, what I really want for you is for you to be able to receive praise and criticism with the same kind of even keeled humble attitude that says uh, I ought to be going to hell but because of the mercy of Jesus I'm not I'm secure in the family of God and so I can improve and sometimes I'll do really well and that'll be awesome but either way because of Jesus I'm good that's what I have for you today don't play the comparison game you're about to go to breakout don't you do it yourself. Let me pray for you. Uh, Lord Jesus, um, I pray for you to give us mental health in the biblical sense. Help us to form our minds uh, according to your truth and be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Uh, deliver us from the comparison game. And, uh, help us to improve. I pray, uh, I pray that this training session will be really, really fruitful and that we'll be able to serve you more effectively. But God, help us to anchor our hearts in the truth of what Jesus has done for us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.